tuolta ovet näyttävät sulkeutuvan. Tervetuloa kaikki kuuntelemaan tätä sessiota Presidency and Power. Tämä paneelikeskustelu käydään kokonaan englanniksi ja meillä ei ole tähän nyt tulkkausta. Kun tätä keväällä ehdotin messuille, niin kuulin, että tämä taitaa olla ensimmäinen kerta, kun pidetään täysin englanninkielinen sessio, mutta siihen on meillä erittäin hyvä syy paita nyt sitten englannin kieleen. So this is, uh, this is, panel session will be only in English, and I'm not gonna, we are not going to do any translation, but we have a very good reason for doing this in English, because we have a special guest from, from Russia, Masha Gessen, who has written a book about Vladimir Putin, what kind of a man he is, and what is the uh, Uh, Russian, so to say, the recent history is very well presented in that. Uh, but we are not talking about only the only Putin or Russian history. The idea of this session is that, that uh, in Euro Europe or in the world, there are not. We used to refer that uh, when we had a Kekkonen era in Finland, that uh, we had a very strong president. And all, always the references were, but when the debates that if, if it's a democratic, truly democratic system, but we often refer that there are presidential systems also in other countries. And, and, and uh, the examples was, of course, France. And they had a election in France this year in, in spring. And then, of course, the United States is an, our example. And, and uh, we all know that there is a, uh, there is a presidential election campaign the highest uh, years at the moment. So we are talking about presidency, presidential systems, what is its relation to democracy uh, based, on, based on the recent experiences. Besides Masa Gessen, we have here in a panel Jussi Lähde, uh, who is well known, a political commentator uh, in, in, in Finland and uh, Do I dare call you also a kind of a spin doctor? You've been a you dare anything, <laughs> <laughs> knowing you. And, and uh, you've been involved in many presidential ca campaigns earlier, and now recently, uh, in the spring, you published a book about the last presidential election campaign here in in, in, uh, in Finland. And I assume that you've been following the American setting very closely, also. I welcome also Louis Clerc who's a historian, uh, a doctor, a lecturer in, in uh, working in, at the University of Turku. He's an expert on French politics and international uh, relations history. Uh, he has written about uh, the French election in a forthcoming book that is edited by me and is for forthcoming in... in, in uh, in November, and here are some flyers about the book and the concept uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, and if you are interested, please get a copy of, uh, of the flyer and later of the book as well. Welcome Louis Clerc, and he, he will tell us about French situation. Then we have Risto Uimonen, a journalist who has seen everything in Finnish politics, and I don't know how many books you have written already, many portraits of leading politicians and, and uh, already published one book this year about uh, trade union leader Per Lund, but we are waiting eagerly his, your book about uh, Sauli Niinist, uh, the president who was elected in the spring, and it will be coming out uh, on the 5th of this month, so very, very soon. Well, uh, like I said, we used to refer in Finland in the Kekkonen era, that there are presidential systems also in, in France and United States. But at that time, we didn't refer to Russia. Uh, should we now say that join the gang Russia, the presidential system? Would you call the Russian present uh, system a presidential system, or how do, would you describe it uh, in, in a, let's say, political system ways? I would describe it as a dictatorship. See, yes, that. We have elections, though. Well, no. We have things that are called elections, uh, but with with the 
ruling candidate, and it doesn't matter what he's called at the time that he's running for office. Putin was called prime minister when he was last running for president. Uh, he was still running the country. And that, I think, is one of the hallmarks of a dictatorship. We've seen that a lot. Uh, you know, uh, Joseph Stalin used to change his title every few years. Uh, Slobodan Milosevic changed his title many times. He was president of two different countries. While he was a dictator, he was prime minister once. It didn't matter. He was the dictator. He was running the country. Same thing with Putin. He's been, he served um, two terms as president, then he was uh, prime minister for one term, and then he became president again. Um, his job description did not change because his title changed. Um, when During the last election, there was nobody on the ballot who wasn't personally approved by Putin. There was nobody on the ballot who campaigned. Uh, and Putin had a monopoly on the media, so it's, uh, it's a bit of a stretch to call it an election. Uh, when Yeltsin, in the Yeltsin area, era, when, when uh, uh, the elections weren't that pretty either, I remember Western leaders saying that, well, uh, he's still the first Russian leader uh, elected by the vote. Uh, were the West naive in, in uh, viewing the Russian political system? Um, I don't think the West was particularly naive. In fact, I think it's, um, th these parallels are too facile uh, and, and quite misleading. Uh, the system that Yeltsin was building was a democracy. It was hugely flawed. There were definite violations. Uh, the 96 election, Yeltsin's second election, uh, contained a lot of violations and there was a lot of vote rigging. At the same time, it was a genuine campaign, a genuine election, uh, with genuinely free media uh, and genuine uh, opportunity for the expression of, of free will on the part of the voters. We haven't had an election not like that since. Okay. Well, in Finland, uh, if, if, uh, we have proceeded other way, uh, if we come from the Kekkonen era, we have decreased the power of president. Risto Uyman, and now you've been uh, writing about the pre current president. Uh, what is your view? Is it worth uh, applying for a job like that? Uh, is it just a representative figure now? Uh, you remember that the powers of the Finnish pre president were immense uh, in the first 70 years of Finnish democracy because uh, the constitution, the first constitution of Finland was basically copied from, from that of the, the Chava era in Russia. And, and the president was as powerful as, as a leader as, as uh, Putin is for the time being. But you know, the powers of the Finnish president have been diminished over the years for about 20 years now. And, and the, uh, um, the name of my forthcoming book is Half Power President, which means that I'm, I'm arguing that uh, the present, uh, President Salman Minister only had half of the powers that, for instance, President Kekkonen and the previous presidents had. And, but, you know, in spite of the loss of the power, uh, the office is very tempting. So many people tried to get it, and even even Salvinista, who was basically quite reluctant to to run for presidency uh, in the election 2000, everybody, every Finnish Finnish people here re remember that he refused to become a candidate, and and later on he he changed his mind and uh, always used to give the impression that I'm not very much interested in this job. But I, now that I have gone through his history since 19, basically from 1994 to, to last September, I, I, can, I can tell that uh, it was very, very uh, interesting to see that he had his purpose and he, he, he went after that purpose. And, and he did many things very cleverly without showing that I'm very willing to become a president. Just like Mama Koivis during his time when, when he was uh, would be president. Yeah, that's a traditional Finnish way. I'm not uh, running for anything, but I do want to be elected. <laughs> <laughs> but the French people, they do like their strong 
figures uh, in at the <coughs> Louis Clerc, uh, how did, would you characterize the French situation? You have to have a strong presidency, presidential system. The people. Well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the system of the Fifth Republic that was created in '58. Uh, makes for a very strong president, but it makes also for a, for a rather strong parliament as long as the parliament agrees to use its power and for a strong prime minister. So you, you can have a situation where the prime minister and the government is of a different party or of a different majority than the president is, and in this case uh, the prime minister and the president both have their own areas of power and their own ways uh, to use their constitutional powers. There's also the fact that the strong presidency is uh, historically, historically situated in a way. Uh, the, the French political system has gone from periods where uh, the parliament was the seat of power, the parties, there were much more parties, there was not this kind of big partisanship that you have nowadays. Uh, there were much more parties, they were much more powerful, and uh, they were much smaller as well. Uh, and, and everything happened in the parliament, the, the president was just uh, uh, largely symbolic. Uh, civil servant post, but then in 1958 it's changed, and the constitution that that Charles de Gaulle crafted for himself uh, made the president the, the, the seat of of uh, symbolic uh, political and, and also administrative power. But uh, many forces in France are uh, don't agree so much with that. The left, for example, was very much against this system as long as they were in the opposition. Once they moved in power, of course, uh, they adopted the constitution as it stood. But, but what, what I meant here was that it's, it's really uh, just one pattern that is uh, susceptible to change and, and it doesn't come from any, any uh, sort of eternal rule of the cultural, an eternal cultural clique that would be in the French psyche. It is just the, the result of specific circumstances that last since the 1950s. Uh, is, Michael, Michael, let, let me ask you one question because you mentioned that your constitution dates back to uh, 1958, and at that time uh, we had President Kekkonen, and, and, and the powers of the Finnish president were the strongest in Europe. And many people say that the call copied our constitution. Is there any truth, truth, truth about that? I mean, as far as presidency is concerned. Yeah, well, that, that's that's been one of my uh, of my pet peeves since I'm in Finland. I've tried to check this. Uh, Maurice Duverger was the the, the the jurist who wrote for uh, the role the, the the Fifth Republic Constitution. Had contacts with uh, some Finns or some Finnish uh, academics, for example, Jan Magnus Jansson. But I found I found nothing. Uh, I found no no paper either in Duverger's papers or in in Jansson's papers or or elsewhere that would link directly to that. There's just a few um, in, in memoirs. It's, it's been a rumor that's been going all, all since the 1950s. And of course, Kekkonen made, made a big thing of the fact that his own position as president has, in, has influenced uh, the world. But, but I didn't find any, any uh, black and white written sign of that. Well, these presidential campaigns, they they put the emphasis of politics on characters. You have clear figureheads compared to a parliamentary system where the, each of the parties, parties are the main players. Now, my question to you, see, you is uh, following campaigns, uh, does this put emphasis on kind of a macho type of leaders, strong leaders? What kind of an effect does it have for the political culture in general that you have so person personified uh, political uh, systems? Well, usually uh, nations tend, in, in a peacetime, tend to choose an, uh, an antithesis to the, the former president. You have, uh, in France, France, you have extremely powerful president. If you combine with a powerful person like Sarkozy, you end up in a situation where the French nation wanted Ben Diagayari kind of figure for the president now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they, I think they, the basic thing is uh, why these figures are so important and why it's so important to go through their personality. This week, uh, Hanno Lettila published a book about uh, President Daria Halonen 
And actually, that book tells extremely well how the story of her family affects whole her decision making processes, and and uh, it's actually there's certain similarities to uh, Vladimir Putin's story. Now, this uh, coming from the rocky, rough town neighborhood in her youth. So it, I think that's uh, that's very important when you have a system where there are extremely strong personalities. Nations should know who those people are. And my question to Marshall is that will we ever know anything real about Putin? His his his. Will, will, cause, uh, this is a great book. Everyone should read it. It should be it should be also discussed. The, the national disgrace in Finland was that in our uh, previous election, the candidates didn't talk anything about Russia. They didn't talk anything about Putin. And there's two reasons for that. If we would have opened the discussion of what happened in, in, uh, in Russia in previous elections, we should have opened the discussion about that, what happened in Finland 1972. <laughs> but will we ever know? Um, we really actually, um, I don't think there's much to know. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, I think this is the flip side of, um, of what we're talking about. Uh, there is the possibility of these huge personalities that wield great power. There's also the flip side, which is that when great power is given to a very small person, that elevates that, that, that person regardless of whether there's anything there. And I think that's exactly the case of Vladimir Putin. There's really nothing there. It's, he's a very flat, two-dimensional man. Um, it's kind of not funny. It's, uh, I mean, uh, somebody who is not very smart, very poorly educated, uh, has very basic in instincts, is using those instincts to run a huge country with the world's largest arsenal of nuclear warheads. He should be running Las Vegas. I mean, that's uh, if if you if you read this book, you 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 find his his primary interest uh, in 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 Leningrad, uh, turn to Saint Petersburg, yeah, casinos, yeah. the casinos. He should be running Las Vegas. That's the kind of person that this book opens. Well, I think that was the first thing he took uh, over was the casinos in uh, Saint Petersburg in uh, in your story. But uh, you referred earlier when we discussed about this uh, macho image that it's turning against uh, people are laughing about uh, this type of a presentation of a leader as a macho leader uh, your comment to that and I would like to hear also Louis commenting on how did it affect the Sarkozy case that, that his hyperactive uh, macho image did it turn against him and then came flat Poland in place but possibly maybe you start um. Yeah, it's 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 turning against Putin. He's overdone it. Ever since he's been in office, he's um, gone for a sequence of publicity stunts and photo ops. He's driven everything that can be driven, flown everything that can be flown. Uh, he's flown fighter airplanes. He's um, steered submarines. Uh, he descended in the Baikal uh, in a in a mini submarine. Examine the water set seems clean enough to me. We can keep polluting it. Uh, then he switched to uh, the animal kingdom to show that he's king of the jungle. Uh, he's been <laughs> photographed shirtless, you know, fishing in Siberia. Then he went on to put a satellite collar on a Siberian tiger. Then he got involved with snow leopards. Then he put a satellite collar on a polar bear. Then he flew with Siberian cranes. Now, when I was going through all of that, I actually realized that he was very consistent in going for the largest animal of a particular species. So it's a very, you know, and, and he takes the dominant role toward that representative of, of, the, of the species. So he has to put the collar on the, on the tiger, he has to lead a flock of Siberian cranes, which are the largest cranes in the world. Um, so um, it was the cranes that really kind of uh, broke people's patience, and uh, and the, the opinion polls show that people at this point find him pretty ridiculous. The the crane stunt was in itself rather ridiculous, and uh, um, I think if he had more reflection and 
was more and more in touch with reality. He knew how risky it was to put on a white coat and get in a hang glider uh, and try to pretend he was a crane uh, to lead the flock of cranes that backfired. It looked like the Finnish Eggman, so to say. <laughs> but Louis, how did, how did the job go? It's the, you went for cranes because it was the only thing in the country that he could actually set free. <laughs> There was nothing. Well, there, 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 there been a, there's been a lot of analysis of the crane stunt. Uh, my favorite actually has to do with the with the pussy riot, uh, you know, because their punk prayer went, uh, "Mother of God, please get rid of Putin." So the idea, is, one of the interpretations was that Putin went up in the air and God didn't take him. Therefore, he was in the right. That's even better. <laughs> but what about the Macho Sarkozy? Did it turn against him? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think so because in, if we come, if we roll this back to 2007 when he was elected, actually he was very popular, and this, this whole idea of a new, uh, a new younger, uh, more energized uh, president after a few years of, of Jacques Chirac that had <coughs> really lost lost his, his appeal uh, to the to, to the French population really came as a as a breath of fresh air. You know, if we talk purely on, on image ground, and if you talk purely about campaigning and, and, and trying to relate at a very, very um, uh, uh, sentimental level with, uh, with the people, he, he was liked, he, was, uh, he, he came at the right time. But after that, uh, maybe this, this uh, energetized way of doing politics uh, tired lots of people. And, but, but if we look at the... If we look at the um, at the results of the campaign, it was very tight. After all, it's 50-50, This the, the result of the elections. So it did not. It, it's not uh, a, a complete rejection of the Sarkozy style and a complete rejection of his politics that that uh, got him out of power. But really, really, it was much tighter tighter than that. And 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 the French did not did not um, reject in a way only on the style, but also the politics. You see. We'll see a very tight election next week. And, but have you seen any macho pictures about uh, President Obama? None. There are none macho pictures, and he might lose because of that. How about Romney? Well, he's been. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, this kind of. Uh, well, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't. He, he has all the field to play. If you if you think remember if you remember John McCain, who would have been a great great president unless the Republicans would have missed his campaign and his political uh, agenda six years ago, but he he was kind of a the, 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 he they they all matched him then. And I think that's, but this is this is the, this is the uh, unmacho American campaign since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yes. I I disagree with that just for the fun of it. The the uh, I think if Obama loses this election, it will be purely on politics and not so much on the on the on, on the uh, on, on body politics. <laughs> well, it's a tight race. In, in a tight race, these kind of things tend to get more and more attention from the people who explain them. Risto, you, you have followed Saudi minister from, for, for years, or is there a change in his image? I mean, at least in uh, caricatures, he used to be the cigarette smoking, roller skating, macho man, but what about this election now? Did, did he turn that, <coughs> soften the picture? <coughs> Yeah, because of the presidential election system in Finland where we have a direct election. So uh, the winner must please the majority of the voters. So and this is this is always affecting a lot how candidates behave. And uh, and and Saudi minister has been trying to be behave uh, in a presidential way in, 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 in many respects. But you know he also uh, tried to differ differentiate himself from his own party, and he, he had 
opinions which his, which differed from from his own party, and also the time when he was the uh, speaker of the parliament. Uh, you remember he was not popular among the parliamentarians, the members of parliament, parliament, and because he cut the benefits that that the uh, members of the parliament had, and but you know, the public applauded that they they liked it a lot, and it's uh, uh, he, he acted in a way in the same way as Mount Corbis did in his time when he ran for the presidency. So he, he, he wanted to be a non-party candidate and, and, and Saulinina succeeded in this way very well. And uh, his, his campaign was, in my opinion, based very much on substance as the campaigns of others as well. So his problem was that he's so popular that he, can't do it. he shouldn't do anything yeah. to spoil yeah. the... Uh, in, in, in that respect, he was in, in the same position as as uh, Manu Koyesto in uh, 1982, when when everybody expected uh, Ninister uh, to become elected, so his only aim was not to destroy his popularity, like Koyesto did. Uh, and I think he was extremely sensitive with the with the sector that he he six years uh, earlier when when he lost the election quite tightly, it was the, the mothers whose support he failed to gain in, in, that, in that amount that he would have been elected and now he was extremely, extremely uh, co uh, concentrating not to bother them, not to bother the mothers. That was through, through all the campaign, it was the analysis six years before that that's where the, that campaign failed. But uh, in my opinion, six years ago, when he, he became second and not, not, did, not, did not win the election, the, the main obstacle that he had was his uh, uh, stance to finish NATO membership. He, he was most pro-NATO candidate at that time, and, and he, he learned a lesson from that. And, and, and this time he kept his mouth shut in this respect and he has kept his mouth shut since then because you know and the president cannot anymore say that Finland should apply for NATO membership because he had to take into account what, what the government thinks and he has to act in, in, in a close co cooperation with the government and for the time being when we are speaking about the NATO membership matter so uh, President of Finland is in favor of NATO membership. Basically, this is his basic view, and also uh, the Prime Minister of Finland is favorable to that. His basic atti attitude is very favorable to NATO membership. But you know, even though the most powerful figures of Finnish foreign policy are are in favor of NATO membership, nothing will happen uh, during this. Uh, government, but we don't know what's going to ha happen after that. But I, I'm doubtful about about that change, even then. Uh, well, uh, Marcia, you mentioned uh, earlier that you don't really call the last election a, at, at least you can't call it a fair election in <coughs> any ways. But it still was uh, was a big mobilizing moment in in uh, current Russia that there was a uh, such a wave of opposition came up but uh, no one expected and uh, uh, so I, I guess one could say that uh, when you arrange an election you always run a risk that something might happen. Could you reflect a bit about that opposition wave about, uh, at the last presidential election? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, when you play with the concept of elections, uh, as a dictator, you always run a risk, and we've seen that happen with, um, again, Milosevic was overconfident, he called an election, and he didn't uh, summon enough forces to rig the election because he had overestimated uh, his popularity. Um, I think that uh, Saakashvili, whom I wouldn't call it a, a dictator, but you know, certainly uh, has some problematic qualities, um, he completely miscalculated what the election that just happened. He's uh, certainly putting on a, a, a very good face, which is to his credit at this point, but, uh, but he planned to win. He just assumed uh, he would. And um, 
Uh, none of this actually applies to what happened with Putin, uh, who, uh, because for him, uh, the experience of watching Mikhail Gorbachev lose control of the Soviet Union is a formative political experience, is the formative political experience. He will always uh, overdo it and he will always put, uh, overprotect himself uh, in, in, in case of an attack on his power. So um, he's fairly invulnerable to, to simple missteps like that, but, but he was surprised by the protest movement that flared up around the parliamentary election um, on December 4th and um, sort of culminated with the presidential election on March 4th. People um, felt humiliated by what had happened uh, in, the, in, the, in the run up to the, pres uh, to the parliamentary election. One of the things that had happened was that Putin had announced that he was going to become president again and Medvedev was going to be prime minister and that this was all arranged ahead of time. <clears throat> they had agreed on this a long time ago and now they were letting people know. That was a breach of the social contract between the dictator and the people. Uh, before that, there was a sort of uh, tacit agreement. Uh, I pretend to hold an election, you pretend to vote in it. Uh, and we pretend that I'm an elected leader. Um, that was, uh, when, when, when that pretense was punctured, that actually proved very traumatic for the country. Uh, people felt insulted, uh, humiliated, and since generally the experience of living in Russia and being the, a Russian subject uh, is humiliating and insulting, uh, it sort of played into, into, into a general sense of discontent. And something amazing happened when people um, showed up for the parliamentary election, larger numbers than expected on December 4th. Um, what was even more interesting was that people signed up to be election monitors uh, in large numbers and were able to document uh, significant violations that occurred during the elections. The violations were routine. It was the presence of independent monitors in great numbers that was not routine. Not only were they able to document them and show them online, uh, but they were able to communicate to, to huge circles of people who had not been engaged with politics in any way. And that was one of the striking things with the protest movement was the, uh, was the sort of the, the narrative of the protest movement was I had no involvement with politics until December 4th. On December 4th, I became an election monitor and now I can't keep quiet. I mean, this was sort of the classic story. Uh, the drawback of having so many people suddenly, uh, yeah, and then what happened December 5th, uh, there was a protest, one of a, seri a long series of protests and all of these protests had been drawing maybe two, three hundred people. Uh, the man who had uh, secured the permit for this protest had applied for a license for 500 people, and at least 5,000 and more like 10,000 showed up. Uh, the poor guy who actually had the permit uh, went to jail for 15 days for exceeding the number of protesters. Um, but it was amazing, you know, walking to the protest, I thought, well, who, is, who the hell is going to come to this protest? Uh, I, I always go, but uh, it is freezing rain, it's dark, it's cold, it's awful, and then I get there and everybody I know is there. Everybody. Um, so, um, five days later, about 50,000 people come out to protest. In another two weeks, 100,000 people come out to protest. It, it, it felt like it was snowball. But, it was a large number of people who were uh, new to politics and fairly naive. And that sense of, um, of, of being suddenly powerful and being suddenly together, for them translated into the expectation that something would change. Like, now. And when uh, Putin blatantly stole the March 4th election, claiming to have 63% of the vote, so claiming to you know, have a landslide victory in the first round, um, which wasn't true at all according to independent exit polls. That was, uh, it was just so blatant and so insulting and I expected that it would make people angry and it would make people come out in even greater numbers. But it actually was really disillusioning for a lot of people. Uh, because there are so many of us in the street and still nothing changes, we're powerless. Uh, and that, you know, getting back to your question, uh, is, 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 the, is the drawback of these elections in, under the conditions of dictatorship, is that they're disempowered. Yes, uh, <clears throat> when we are speaking about two presidents, Putin and, and Nihilist, uh, 
it's very interesting to know that, you know, I earlier spoke, spoke about the powers of, of present Finnish president. So he has less powers than any of his predecessors had. So, but what powers does he still have? So he, he, his main power is to foster bilateral relations outside the European Union. And, and which means that he has to take care of Finnish relations with Russia, United States, China, <coughs> India, and so on. And as we all know, uh, Russia is the main main player with our president. And so it's very interesting to see what what Saudi minister is going to do because he has he, here he has real powers within bilateral <coughs> relations. And now when he's dealing with with, with the president who you call Russia. Uh, who is a representative of the dictatorship, and we have our president, who is is a representative of our democracy. How they deal with each other? What What is your opinion? You know, many many people here in Finland say that already within this first half half year of Nidister's presidency, he has been tested by Putin. Is that correct? I'm afraid I don't know anything about this. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I would like to put uh, both uh, you see, uh, I mean, Masha described how unexpected things happen at the election, but uh, quite unexpected things happened in Finland in the last election as well, and you've written about it. Uh, the, the, and is there a dissolution after the election, and people first get engaged and are enthusiastic, and then what happens after that? Well, that's an extremely good question. Uh, First of all, in all three major campaigns, uh, President Niinistö's campaign, uh, Baba Väyrynen's campaign, and Pekka Haavisto's campaign, there were a lot of people who wanted to take part into politics without getting involved with the parties. And... Uh, I think that's a that's a phenomenon that's going to continue, and it's going to re restructure the the model of, of what our uh, how our country will be run in the next 20-30 years. We've seen something now. It's not a it's not a quick change, but uh, I have to say that. It's a, it's a great challenge for our party system because this uh, these people who come in for this kind of campaigns they are they are people who who can inspire who cannot can be inspired but who won't be inspired by the old way of doing party politics and that's uh, and the, there it's extremely. Uh, Fascinating to see what what has happened in some of the major major cities in in, in Russia, uh, or what is happening in, in Ukraine, in, in in Belarus at the moment. It's uh, I think the people are are remodeling the way. Of, of running running politics without asking anymore uh, the, the po party as itself is, is, is something that is a, as a concept will be challenged in each of these countries in a different way oh, but in France uh, the presidential election did it mobilize people in a different way uh, or, uh, than the party system uh, or was it run by the parties? Well, at, at the moment, it's, it's very much run by the parties, but the, the problem is that uh, since the parties in the system as it stands nowadays in, in France, where you have these very strong two big parties on both sides of the political spectrum, uh, the parties are in a way electoral machines that you switch on when the elections are on, and you switch off when the elections are off. So during the campaign they exist, but they don't, like before, uh, act anymore as a, as a sort of uh, alternative social place where you can create a new society, discuss with like-minded people, etc., etc. And so militants that were looking for that uh, moved to other forms of political activism. And uh, uh, this time I would agree with you, say that, that this, this uh, 
other forms will rise, and you see them rising already in France you know, on the fringes of the parties. Um, I, I, I don't really know how they are going to be able to reinvest this, this activity into, into, uh, in, into the politics, into the, the elections that go are very much organized by the parties. But, but this, the, the, the potential exists. Yes. I think the uh, extremely important thing that uh, Esther pointed out is the, that, that from my, my point of view, Finland has one of our first peacetime presidents now. Because uh, Kekkonen, in, in many ways actually, also, also uh, President Koivisto, both uh, declared themselves as wartime presidents. It was still the war alert of the nation for the nation, and in that kind of uh, phases, you can you can guide a country with an extremely rough hand. And that comes to my question for Masha: How long can Vladimir Putin rule Russia without a war? And which of course, we are kind of uh, uh, wondering what might be the next direction then. It's <laughs> a great question uh, because, uh, and you, you completely put your finger on it, uh, he, um, his power uh, is based on a continuing election campaign. He has no accomplishments to point to. Uh, he, uh, his basic message has been for the last 12 years, Russia is surrounded by enemies, Russia is on the brink of catastrophe, and I am the only person who can uh, keep the catastrophe at bay. Now, uh, with an eroding base of support, an eroded base of support, he needs to radicalize the fear, uh, and he needs to radicalize uh, his supporters. Right now, he is relying very much on the sort of orthodox versus modern divide to do that. Um, if that doesn't work for him, if he feels that he needs something else, um, then I think we're likely to uh, see renewed uh, ter acts of terrorism, you know, which I believe that the apartment block explosions in 1999 were organized by the security services to um, basically to, to, to shore up support for the newly appeared Putin. Uh, I think that the security services have had a hand in some of the other terrorist attacks in Russia since. The problem with those terrorist attacks, or one of the problems with the terrorist attacks, is that they need to get worse every time. They need to get more scary because the country grows immune to them. Uh, it's hard to imagine anything that is worse than the school siege of Beslan in 2004, in which more than 300 people, most of them children, died. Um, and I think that because it's hard to imagine anything worse, we haven't seen a major uh, terrorist attack since that would, that would have been designed to, to get the people riled up. But it could happen. And uh, I think it's more likely that it will be something inside the country uh, or um, inside Russia's existing borders. Um, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility of... Uh, of another war with Georgia um, or other sort of escalating tensions around the Russian border. Because the problem is that you are you are still choosing our president. The the fact is that on the on the on this uh, uh, two round system, every, we, we 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 totally freely pick up two candidates, but then we choose the tougher character because of the Russian. The tougher character will be chosen because she or he has to deal with Putin or, or Putin or Putin. So, so Daria Halonen was tougher than Saudi Nienist six years ago. Yes. Uh, um, question to Master Steele. Uh, I mean, it sounded so much like uh, the old Soviet times that uh, you have to run the country like it's uh, under a siege all the time, that you have foreign fears, and, and uh, that is <coughs> maybe a long Russian tradition in that way. But uh, we used to speak about Putin and Medvedev, uh, that, that they, they 
well, you can't say twin towers because they are so short. But but now we can uh, now now we can. We have something against short men. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, but but, but uh, is it is it uh, now we can say that Medvedev didn't have a independent role while he was a president? What's the assessment? Well, some of us have been saying it all along, uh, and my assessment from the beginning was that uh, Medvedev was the first lady. Uh, in a very, in a very traditional, very sort of American style uh, uh, configuration, where he had a ceremonial role, he reached out to the disenfranchised, um, and if you look at his um, uh, at his rhetoric and, and and his behavior in that light, it suddenly all makes sense. You know, why would Medvedev go and visit a prison, uh, and then meet with the intelligentsia? Well, because. Uh, inmates and the intelligentsia in contemporary Russia are equally disenfranchised. They're small, marginalized constituencies, and it was his humanitarian mission to reach out to them and to try to speak their language. That's all. It was a ceremonial role, um, and that you know that goes back to to, to uh, wh where we started, uh, where in a dictatorship, uh, the role of the presidency shifts completely depending on who is uh, in that chair. For the four years that Medvedev was president, it was a ceremonial role. It was uh, it was the prime minister who was head of state. Uh, now it's the president again who's head of state. That has nothing to do with whether Russia is a presidential republic. What about Risto, your assessment about uh, Finnish system? What is in the future president and the prime minister who runs the country? Well, it's self-evident that the uh, prime minister is responsible for nearly everything, with, with the exception of these bilateral relations, foreign foreign relations, and uh, the in a way, you know, Finnish people are eagerly watching in the presidential election, and they even have not noticed that the change of constitution, how, how small the powers of, of the Finnish presidents are, are for the for the time being, and it's very hard to see that. Uh, if he really has the president of Finland really has any 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 own power uh, that he can use, he, he he has been tied very very carefully to the powers of, of the government, so so to to the parliamentary system, so he cannot make any decisions without without consulting the, the government. And can he needs to settle down to this limited role. Uh, he has a young wife, maybe. He doesn't, doesn't have, have to. Bit. He doesn't have to because in in, in in people's mind, the president is still the the last line of defense. So that, but in, in practice, he is yeah. not anymore. In, in people's yes. minds, that's what you say. In, yeah. in people's but, minds, when when we if we come to a, a tough situation, so it will be prime minister who will be handling it. But it's a, it's a question of nation growing up someday. What about the France situation? I think President and Prime Minister, can you assess that balance? The, the situation is completely different because the system is completely different. I would say in Finland, the, the President retains this symbolic role. He's not anymore the, the big head honcho, but he's, he's still keeping uh, himself, and as, as you said earlier, as the, as the, as the people's representative, in a way. as the, the one that goes over the parties, over the, the interest groups, and represents a, a, a wider group. Uh, in France, the difference is that is that he actually yields most of the political power as well. And the, the prime minister, at least in the setting that we have nowadays, is just uh, uh, is, is, a, is a secretary of state in the old sense of the term. It just puts in in place what the president is has, has decided. And if you see at the moment, you see fractures inside the government, but it's mostly uh, shades of the same color. It's mostly ways to implement the same program. But the program comes from the from the from the president. I, I would like to add one thing. You know, uh, the less power the president has has in Finland, the more he has to use the use the media, and the press. And if you take into account, you know, we know first seven months of, of Nilisto in, in power. Uh, you know, if you look how he has acted, so so he, because he have no not he has not official power. Anymore, so much as his predecessors had, predecessors had. But you know, he, he continues the same pattern, 
that he used as the Speaker of the Parliament. You know, the Speaker has no power, also no power. So he has, he has, he has been, speak, been speaking to the, to the nation, to the people, through the press, through the media, all the time. And this is how, how he has, we, we have seen that he is still a distinctive, distinctive figure. So he is non, not non-existent. You should also tell to our current speaker that he doesn't have power. <laughs> well, I'm not going to make any conclusions about our de debate here or discussion, but I do place a question to the panelist: who is the next president of the United States who will want to pick up? If, if there's no money in that, then I won't go. I won't go to say anything. I <laughs> <laughs> can bet, but, but you can't really. I bet you ten euros that it's Barack Obama. <laughs> Ten, ten bucks for Barack Obama. Any, any, I think that somebody was ten euros. Right? That's, that's significant. Yeah, that's, yeah, of course it's ten euros. <laughs> no, the, you, you can't really, the, the things are so tight that, that it's very difficult to, if you, if you look at the, at the national surveys and then after that uh, state per state, then Obama has a small lead, but what do you know? Any other opinions? I think Romney will get more votes and Obama will be elected because there has to be a God with humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my, uh, well, we have to go back a few weeks back. And you know, Obama was leading by five points. And Mitt Romney did very well in the television discussions, uh, debates. And, and he has been a able to uh, go by Obama in the polls. But they are very even. But uh, you know, there are 13 states that will decide it. And I must still believe that uh, the, the more serious person, Obama, will win. Well, because um, Obama's victory depends on voter turnout. The more people turn out, the more likely that he will win. I'm going to send a karmic prediction to the United States that Mitt Romney is going to win. But it seems I go for Obama as well, so we have just elected Barack Obama for the second term. Thank you very much.